In your Bibles tonight, the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter number 1, Revelation chapter number 1, and we're going to begin reading here, we'll read the first eight verses tonight and introduce and begin this uh, series, Lord willing, as the Lord leads us through the book of Revelation. If you ask folks, I've been in church work for a long time, you ask people, where would you like to, uh, me to preach from next? Most of the time they say Revelation, and uh, someone said it like this, they said that most church people want to hear from Revelation. Most pastors don't want to touch it. And, uh, and I understand that sentiment. But the book of Revelation is not a book that you should be scared of. It's a book that's blessed of God. It's a book of great encouragement for God's people. And I'm looking forward to sharing some messages from the book of Revelation and asking the Lord's blessing as we uh, work our way through this and preach God's word. There's a message of hope and encouragement no doubt, in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, let's just begin with the title, The Revelation. I want you to notice something. It is Revelation and not Revelations. It is not Revelations because it's not many revelations. It's one revelation of one very important character, the Lord Jesus Christ. The word revelation is not a word to be scared of. Some people hear the word revelation and they're scared. If you really want to scare people, you use a different form of the exact same word. Not revelation, but apocalypse. The word apocalypse and the word revelation are two words that are really synonymous. They're the same word. If you were to look at the original language, the word revelation, it is, looks like apocalypse. And I want to talk to you just a minute about revelation. When we read this Book of the Bible, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, we find in verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And what that means is it's the unveiling, the revealing, the showing of Jesus Christ. And we're going to see Jesus Christ in his perfection. We're going to see Jesus Christ when his plan comes to a conclusion and victory is, is, is his and God's people are victorious forever. It's what the old preacher said. I read the back of the book and we win. When we reveal Jesus in all of his glory, we're uncovering, we're unveiling, we're apocalypsing uh, the Lord Jesus, apocalypse. Don't be scared of that word. It literally means a reveal. I'm gonna. We'll have an apocalypse right now. Are y'all ready for an apocalypse? Here we go. Here's an apocalypse. There's an apocalypse right now. I just apocalypsed the fact that my wife graciously ironed my shirt very nicely tonight. Uh, we've had an apocalypse. I just revealed to you, apocalypsed the fact that Ruth ironed my shirt. Now, is that scary? No. And when we think about the Lord Jesus and the apocalypse of Jesus Christ, it is not something to be feared. It is something to be studied, anticipated, and looked forward to because when God's people see Jesus Christ in all of his glory, it's going to be a sweet, sweet thing. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Let's read together these first eight verses and we'll take our message the Bible says in verse 1 of Revelation 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy. And keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you. And peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness. And the first begotten of the dead. And the prince of the kings of the earth. Unto him that loved us. And washed us from our sins in his own blood. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is... And which was and which is to come, the Almighty. 
and we begin our study in the book of Revelation, the first eight verses. The Bible says in verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. We're going to talk about the revelation of Jesus Christ. I really think that one of the main reasons why pastors are hesitant to preach on the book of Revelation is because there are several conflicting views and interpretations of the book of Revelation. And I don't love contention. I don't claim to know everything. Uh, I know that I don't. But the best that I know how, I want to preach and share with you God's Word, the book of Revelation. And when we come to this book, we have to understand some ways that folks look at it. There are, about, there are four really basic ways that people look and view and interpret the book of Revelation. Uh, the first one is that they call it preterist, the preterist view. And don't get too... Uh, tied down in these details, but I want you to understand why there's conflict in interpreting the book of Revelation, because some people look at the book of Revelation with this preterist, blue, preterist view, which believes that the Revelation dealt only with the church in John's day. It's like you read the book of Revelation, all oh, that's sweet, but that doesn't apply to us, because that was something that was written to a group of people, a church that existed uh, some 2,000 years ago. Uh, they believe that it was for that church and not necessarily for our church and therefore the book of Revelation is uh, not quite so relevant to us today. The problem is when we read the book of Revelation, we know that it's, going to, it's prophesying things that are to come and there's lots of reason for us to believe that the book of Revelation is something that we can study and know and need to know for the time that we live in. The second view is the historicist. And this view, it's an approach that believes that the Revelation is sweeping, disordered. It's a panorama of all church history. It's for all churches in all different ways. And it's something that is just uh, to be used allegorically to encourage and help. The poetic view is similar. That's the third of the views. The poetic view is a view, it's a approach that believes that the Revelation is a book full of pictures and symbols intended to encourage and comfort persecuted Christians in John's day. The poetic view. Finally, the fourth view is actually the view that I would lean towards and I believe to be true. The futurist view. And the futurist view looks at the book of Revelation and it understands that the first three chapters of the book of Revelation give us understanding of the things that have been, the things that are currently. And then after you finish the end of chapter number three and you begin to embark on chapter number four, we believe that the Bible's teaching us of things that are yet to come, yet to be fulfilled. And when you look at this view of the scripture, you understand, I think that it gives us a more sound way to interpret the Bible. We interpret the scriptures uh, literally, unless the Bible makes it clear that what's being said is figurative. And if we are consistent in our interpretation of Genesis through Revelation, when we turn to Revelation, we're going to have to view the book of Revelation in a futurist view, understanding that the book of Revelation is prophetic of things to come that is going to happen when Jesus comes. The book of Revelation. We're going to interpret it the best we can, and we're going to see what God has to say, and there's so many wonderful things in this book. Tonight's message is titled, very simply, number one, very simply, The Revelation of Jesus Christ. And here's the first point. Number one, the revelation has a purpose. The revelation has a purpose. Let's look at verse number one, the first three verses here as we consider the fact that the revelation has a purpose. The Bible says the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, when our Bible's titled, we see uh, just above this in my Bible, you see the title of the book, The Revelation of St. John the Divine. You see that? There, there's no conflict here. Uh, this revelation was given to St. John the Divine. He writes it, and he's led by the Spirit. God shows it to him. He writes it. It's given to St. John to be written, to be shared. But it is a revelation of its subject matter is the Lord Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. Where does the Bible testify the book of Revelation comes from? It comes from God. Why? The Bible says in verse 1, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. What's the purpose? To show. 
The Bible wants us to know what God's up to. The Bible wants us to see some things and be encouraged by some promises that God gives and the act and the fact that God is going to complete his work on earth. That sin and Satan and the prince of the power of the air will not have dominion forever, but there's coming a day when old Satan will be defeated ultimately and finally and forever. In the book of Revelation, we see that. How many of you had a little battle with the devil lately? (laughs) There's no doubt that we're struggling in this day that we live that Satan is the prince of the power of the air is at work he hates families he hates marriages he hates parents he hates children he hates churches and Christians and we're as God's people to be sober and be vigilant because our adversary the devil is a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour I want you to know something he may be a player on the field now but there comes a time where he'll be defeated and conquered forever Jesus' glory and power and might is going to be revealed. The Bible says the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. I don't know about you, but when I read this verse of Scripture, I have big questions. Shortly come to pass. I don't know about you, but shortly is less than 2,000 years to me. How about you? Shortly is less than two. If I say I'll be there shortly, I'm sometimes slow and I've got a hint of procrastinator in my genetics and in my heart. But if I say shortly, I mean less than 2,000 years. There's a couple of things that I think are quite interesting about this word shortly. The Bible says we're going to show to the servants of God things which must shortly come to pass. The word shortly here is a word that can be understood to mean once it starts, it's going to happen fast. Have you ever been in a situation where you're waiting, you're waiting, you're waiting, and somebody says, now listen, you be ready, because when it happens, it happens fast. It's like a roller coaster. You wait in line, you wait in line, you wait in line, you wait in line. If you were to sit on the on the if you were to get set down on the roller coaster and the person were to come across the air, they would say, guess what? The roller coaster is going to happen shortly. A lot of times this word can mean very simply that when it happens, when it starts, it's going to happen fast. And the events of the book of Revelation, they happen quickly. As soon as the rapture of the church occurs, the actions and the work of God to bring to the conclusion, the swift conclusion The end of the world and the return of Christ and victory over Satan, it happens quickly, shortly. Now, that's one explanation. Am I absolutely 110% sure that's exactly the way it is? No. And if you think you are, you may not be as smart as you think you are. I'll just tell you something. If God wrote this and it says shortly, and he says it's, just, it's going to happen shortly, it can happen any time, it can, it's going to happen shortly, and if God's idea of shortly is 2,000 years, he's smarter than I am, and that's just fine. Let me tell you when Jesus is going to come back, when God determines that Jesus is going to come back, and we're to be ready, we're called to be ready for the return of Christ, the rapture of the church, and it can happen shortly. Let me tell you, when people tell me they're looking at the signs of the times, And they're there. There's no doubt. I think Jesus is coming back. You know what I say? I agree. And without fail, my response is, the return of Christ is closer today than it's ever been. And it's true. I can't pick the time, can't choose the time. When the Lord returns, oh, how sweet it will be. The Bible says that he's going to show us his servants, things which must shortly come to pass. The Bible continues verse number 1. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. And so the, the Bible says here that God signified the message of Jesus' revelation to John. That word signified is kind of interesting. If you're to break that word up, it'll help you understand the book of Revelation. Signified, signified. Do you see that? Signified. Basically, it means that God showed to John his plan for the future in signs. In signs. 
And John, as he sees these amazing signs, he explains to them, to us, the best he can. And actually does it perfectly because he's led by the Spirit of God. He signs, he gives us signal and signs and tells us what he sees. It's interesting that God would use signs. How many of you ever noticed that words get messed up? The definition of words get messed up. Excuse the illustration, if necessary. But many, many years ago, downtown Knoxville was a really fun place to go. And so they had this great idea. Let's name the main street in downtown Knoxville Gay Street. The word gay then and the word gay today has two completely different meanings. And so God signified to John in symbols and signs the revelation of Jesus Christ. And some of us look at the signs that we find in the book of Revelation. Our eyes go crossed. But I think that God had a plan for clarity. God had a plan for a method that would last through the ages. He signified it. He signed it to us. The Bible says in verse number 2, Who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. John says, look, I'm giving record to the word of God. I want you to see something in verse number 2. It's very important. Who bear record of the word of God. you see that? John says, I'm bearing record of the word of God. Do you know what John knew to be true about the book of Revelation? He knew that it was true that the book of Revelation was the word of God. The reason I say that, there are certain folks and even denominations of people who completely omit the book of Revelation from the canon of Scripture. But John the Baptist testified to the fact that what he had to say and what he had to write and what he had to present was that, just that, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ of all that he saw. Verse number 3. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy. And keep those things which are written therein. For the time is at hand. Blessed. I mentioned to you that this revelation has purpose. The revelation is to God's people. The revelation is to show us God's plan. The revelation is intended to encourage and help and bless God's people. I think this is kind of fascinating. Blessed is he that readeth. And they that hear the words of this prophecy. Now, you're tempted, I know, and I am too, to leave this book of the Bible out of my reading. I'm tempted to leave this book of the Bible out of my hearing. I'm tempted to leave this book of the Bible even out of my study. But the Bible makes it plain that blessed, we're going to be blessed, happy, satisfied, complete. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. You see that phrase? The time is at hand. The time is at hand. Jesus could come back at any moment. We should be prepared for the return of Christ. It's an exciting thing to know that Jesus could come back any time. If your heart's in tune with the Lord, it's an especially exciting thing. But if it's not, they would be reminded that the Lord could come for his church at any time. The time is at hand. You see, the revelation has a purpose. God wants to bless his people. God wants to encourage his people. God wants to inform his people. And as we study and learn and know the revelation of Jesus Christ, you're going to find out that God will encourage you with these truths. God will bless you. God will strengthen your faith. God will help you have resolve in the midst of great trouble because the revelation has purpose. Number two, the revelation has power. The revelation has power. Look what the Bible says in verse number 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. John says here, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace. He says, I want you to know something. I'm sending you a message of grace and peace. Grace and peace. How many of you uh, would like to be uh, more gracious? How many of you would like to 
Have folks around you that are more gracious. I like graciousness. One, Christian people should be full of grace. Grace. God gives us grace. God gives us peace. How many of you have been dealing with a tumultuous spirit? How many of you have been battling with grief? Peace. Where can I get grace? Where can I get peace? Where can I get grace to deal with the troubles of life? Where can I get peace to rest in the midst of life's storm? Where can I get grace? Where can I get peace? The revelation has a power. Grace and peace, the Bible says in verse number 4, from, from who? From him which is and which was and which is to come. Where can you get peace? You can get peace from God. Why is it important that it's listed this way? It's kind of interesting. There's three attributes of God linked together here. The number three points to the Trinity of Christ, the Trinity of God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But it reminds us that God, it's Him which is. God is everywhere present. Folks, I want you to know something. You can have peace and grace from God right now because God is with you right now. He's present which was. It's fascinating, wonderful to see and know that God was. God is eternal. There's never been a time that he wasn't. He is and he was. He's eternal God. If you want to have hope from somebody or get answers from somewhere, you should look to an eternal God who has no beginning. He is, he was. The Bible says, and which is to come. He's eternally present. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. In the midst of your storm, you remember something. You have a God that is eternal. He's eternal God. It continues. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. This kind of is a one of those cross-eyed moments. What's the seven spirits which are before his throne? This is a direct reference to the Holy Spirit. You see the number seven? We're I have a message that's signified. You see the number seven? It's a number of completion. I want to read to you a verse from God's Word. You may need to take this in your notes. Isaiah 11 and verse number 2. In Isaiah 11 and verse number 2, the description of this spirit, seven spirits. I'm going to give you a hint. Actually, I'm just going to give you the answer. These seven spirits from verse number 5. It's verse number four. Verse number four is the Holy Spirit. It's our Holy Spirit. The Bible says in 11, Isaiah 11, verse 2, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of fear. Seven attributes to the, of the Holy Spirit. He is Lord. Folks, I want you to know something. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are co-equal. He is the Lord. The Holy Spirit is wisdom. The Holy Spirit is understanding. The Holy Spirit is counsel. The Holy Spirit is might. The Holy Spirit is knowledge. And the Holy Spirit is of the fear of the Lord. We have this seven-part perfect Holy Spirit. We have... Reason to have peace and grace. Why? Because God the Father, He was, He is, He'll always be. God the Holy Spirit is perfect and complete. Verse number four, verse number five, and from Jesus Christ, hallelujah, God the Son. Verse number five, Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, He's risen from the dead. And the prince of the kings of the earth, there's no greater king than Jesus. The Bible describes him like this. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. What has Jesus done for us? The revelation has power. We have power with God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, God the Son. He loved us. Look at verse 5. He loved us and washed us from our sins. Let me point a little something out to you. Notice the order. Jesus loved us and washed us. Make sure you realize 
that Jesus didn't wash you and then love you. Isn't that good to know? He loved me when I was wretched. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He loved us. The word in the past tense is very important. He loved us before when we were unlovely. He loved us in eternity past. He loved us. He loved us unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins and hath made us kings. He's made me royalty in his presence. He's made me priests, his special servants, unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The revelation has power. It's in God. When we come to the book of Revelation, as I bring it to a conclusion, Jesus is revealed. His glory is revealed. His power is revealed. The apocalypse comes and we see the completion of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, in the book of Genesis, sin came into the Garden of Eden and paradise was lost. But in the book of Revelation, paradise is regained. In the book of Genesis, the Garden of Eden is defiled by sin. But in the book of Revelation, the city of God is forever. In the book of Genesis, the serpent appears. In the book of Revelation, the serpent meets his doom. Aren't you glad? In the book of Genesis, sin, sorrow, tears, and the curse begin. In the book of Revelation, they all vanish away. You see, when Jesus has completed his work, the work that he set out to do, and we see it revealed in the Revelation, we have reason to hope. The revelation of Christ is a glorious thing. It has power. It has purpose. Praise God for his revelation. I'm looking forward to seeing what all he has for us. What he all has to show us. He wants to show us something that will encourage us and help us. Strengthen our faith. The revelation of Jesus. Let's pray.